I'm uh, Joel Bennett, president of Organizational Wellness and Learning Systems, and I will let Dave introduce himself. Pretty cool. Yeah, so I'm Dave Reason, and um, I work with the Environmental Protection Agency. I've been there 37 okay. years, and I've had a lot of jobs um, throughout my career. And um, for the topic here, psychological safety, it's kind of like if I was in a situation and it didn't feel safe, I thought to myself, like, I'm a little boat. I'm going to get out of this harbor. I'm going to go someplace else. I'm going to re-anchor. Does it feel safe? Hey, I'm going to do great work. Oh, no, something's changed. Manager's changed. Oh, got to go in some other harbor. So in my career, I've been able to go to safe harbors. And, and one quick story, I went to EPA headquarters on a detail. thing. I was going to do great things, you know. And I got up there, and the culture was so toxic. It was I had a terrible manager. So I was calling Pete. I go like, Pete, you're you're my lifeline. Hey, this is so bad up here. What should I do? And people kind of counsel me, just hang in there. And then I said, man, I'm getting out of here. And I came back to Region Six, and I said, I'm going to do all the fun stuff that I couldn't do at headquarters. And I and I've been able to do that. So that psychological safety is something I've always dealt with, but really didn't know what it was about. But I could feel it. Mm. So there we go. All right. Um, so the definition, this is a lot of the material I'm going to present is just out of um, Amy Edmondson's book, The Fearless Organization. And, you know, just as a backdrop, so um, the story was when you go to YouTube's on, on Amy Edmondson, and she was working on her PhD at Harvard, and she was studying teams. And in that, she was studying, you know, hospital clinical teams. And she would, you know, do assessment of what teams were good and which ones were not. And so the assumption was your better teams would be making less mistakes, right? But when she got looked at her data, the better teams were making more mistakes. And then she said, well, well what is that all about? And then she came up with, the, you know, the psychological safety. They felt more safe sharing their mistakes, right? And that was the correlation that got her really going on. What is the psychological safety? How do we bring it into organizations? And how do you, how do you build it? So that's just a little backdrop. And you can go to YouTube's on Amy, on Amy and read up, hear all about her different stories. But here, this is coming out of the book. It says, the shared belief among team members that you can't be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. Okay, next slide. It's more of an organizational context, right? So it's conditions among multiple levels. So it's personal, it's team, organizational, climate, culture, your manager top management, um, they give individuals the freedom to express themselves as fully as needed and who with, with a voice, your ideas, and contribute to the positive evolution of the whole organization. So that's a broader definition. Thanks for bringing that in, Joe. Now and here's that's different that's meetings, meanings, um, terms like leadership, performance, engagement. Um, but those are a little bit different than psychological safety, but yet connected to psychological safety. And then a, a lack of clarity, uh, specificity, context, or critical to advance clarity and meaning of this term. And then you have many definitions, and this is the academic literature leads to confusion when most of the research is correlatable and not tied to behavioral and examined studies that seek to actually create psychological safety, right? So doing these connections instead of how do you do it, okay? And then this is again out of the book, you know, psychological safety, it's not about being nice. It's not a personality factor. It's not another word for trust. And it's not about lowering performance standards. So that's a that's a quote from, from Amy there. And here's, a, here's one of the videos, and this is also in her book, and she talked about performance standards. And um, in this little matrix here, you have a commitment to urgence, to excellence and an urgency right on the left and the, your psychological safety is on the bottom. And so if you have low urgency, low commitment to excellence, and you have low psychological safety, it's apathy, right? So you're just checked out. You're just showing up, you're collecting your paycheck, you're going home. You're not gonna get beat up. You just, you know, I don't really care. I'm here, I need a job, but I'm not gonna contribute much. And I'm not gonna make any mistakes. Then if you go 
I'm going to shift over to, let's just say, high anxiety, the, the high, you really want to do well, you want to contribute to the organization, but for some reason, you're unable to do that, right? So you have a high risk of making a mistake, right? If you make a mistake, oh my gosh, you're going to get called out for it. The manager's going to like, you know, make an example of you. It's it's very risky, right? So that's that's good. That's the high anxiety point. And so you'll be frustrated. You talk with your peers and you go like, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I my job is awful, right? And then if you go to high level of psychological safety, but you don't have the urgency or commitment to excellence, people are hanging out of the comfort zone, right? So let's, hey, let's try to get this project done. Oh yeah, we'll get to it when we get to it. Everybody just kind of going along. And then if you want to really excel and, and really take advantage of the psychological safety that's given to you, you want to get to the learning zone where you are committed, you have higher urgency to excellence, and they're allowing you to do that. You're, they're allowing you to learn new things and experiment, make mistakes and keep learning. And so I thought about this in, two, in terms of a team's context, right? So at work, you know, I'm into the psychological safety and I kind of make it safe for people. My manager's making it safe for people. But in my estimate, we have too many people in the comfort zone, right? Well, we're just hanging out and they're talking and, well, what are you doing for your weekly reports and what are you doing for all the updates and well too many people i think are in the comfort zone and they don't enjoy being on the edge of the learning zone and to me it's like on a surf man you're on the top of the wave and that's where the fun is that's where the action is so that's just kind of a little dynamic of like you get psychological safety but there's other things to think about right okay so next slide and then she talks about, you know, how do you measure that when you go into a situation? And again, she's focused on team. It's like, um, when you make a mistake, the team's not going to hold it against you, right? You, they're just going to, let's let's keep going. Uh, they're able to bring up problems and talk about tough issues, right? There's a level of trust there. But they're talking amongst themselves about problems. They feel safe enough to bring stuff up. You know, I didn't know about that example. Tell me how to do that, right? And... Um, you know, you're not worried about people that are being different. You're able to take risks. And you ask for help. Hey, I don't know how to do this. Can you tell me? So somebody tell me how to do this. Great. Thank you so much for moving on. And then um, nobody the team is going to deliberately sabotage you. Right. And, you know, in some teams, there are some unsafe people. Right. I've been on teams where we have had trouble people. And um, one of the people that worked was very successful. And I, I said to him, I said, hey, what, what was your secret to success as he retired? And he said, try to pick the people you want on your team. And if you do that, you might, you might be able to pick the people that you have a lot of trust and a lot of um, safety with. And then it becomes really a high performing team. And so that's just kind of like, if you can pick your team, you have a greater sense of success. And then, um, you know, working with the team, your unique skills and talents are valued and utilized. And to tell people that, you know, when you're on your team, thank you for that contribution. That's wonderful. So you can reinforce the safety as you go along on your team. You know, you, you want to build that into your team dynamics. Okay, next. So here's the deal. Um, you can have psychological safety, but it's not enough. Right. And so I was kind of thinking, well, if I can just build psychological safety, it's going to be great. But it's not enough. And so here it talks about psychological safety takes off the brakes that keep people from achieving what's possible. But it's not the fuel that powers the car. Right. So you take off the brakes so people have the ability to be successful and achieve. But it's not the fuel that's running the team. And it talks about the role of leadership. And it says, you know, they, they built psychological safety into the team to spur learning, right? And to prevent failures. And they set high standards and inspire people to enable people to reach them. And just think like, um, you know, a charismatic leader. And I'm going to just, again, like P was talking a little political. I, you know, a good example here might be Barack Obama. So when Barack Obama was running 
in the primaries, it was unbelievable how he inspired people. And, you know, and he built safety into doing things, but it was, it was his vision that got people to really want to excel. And then again, um, number two, they set high standards as far and enable people to reach them. And setting high standards exam was a crucial management task. So you share, you sharpen, you continually emphasize a worthy purpose. And so you have to have these other dynamics attached to psychological safety, right? So that's kind of a key thing that I, I got out of this little research is that you need something else to drive. You can have the setting, but to really achieve and become successful, high performing, you need another dynamic to come into play. Okay, next. And then it says that a work environment that supports learning you learn from mistakes, um, quality improvement. Um, you know, so you're saving the company money, time, and most important, you're sharing your knowledge and you're sharing input. Very good. Okay. And then it says again, this is the whole thing about performance. Now, this is just one dynamic, but that was the matrix that Amy was looking for that she set up. And it says psychological safety frees up people to pursue excellence. It goes back to the little matrix. Psychological safety is research and development, take risks. Um, it's critical. And, and you know, um, Pete talked, one of his presentations in the past was about Google. And here it talks about, you know, the Google teams were more successful than other teams in or, or organizations. And it said, you know, they were outperforming other people. And it could be their underlying example was because they had psychological safety and they were encouraged to make those mistakes and to share those learning experiences. And Pete, you probably saw that when you were out there. Yeah. And then, yeah, then the team performance um, is right here. It's the underpinning of team performance is supported by clear goals, dependable colleagues, first is it's meaningful work and a belief that your work has an impact. And those little factors on top of psychological safety is what creates a high performing team in an organization, I believe. Okay, next. Okay, you know, there's a lot of papers about employee engagement. So I wonder when you read about employee engagement, do they mention psychological safety? Do they mention that or not? Or if you're, you're dealing with organizations and you wanna get greater engagement, can you measure the psychological safety of the unit, of the organization to get that greater engagement? And then this is the bottom engagement, the extent of employee feels passionate about the job and commits to the organization, a willingness to put in the extra effort for one's, you know, a cause, if you will. So, you know, psychological safety is the, the question when you look at, you know, employee engagement, is that word mentioned or not? So, okay, next. Thank you. And then here's some other books. Okay, so these are books I got on Amazon and this fearless organization. It's a really, really good book. I think it's wonderful because she goes into detail about the different matrix. Like I showed different examples. Her new book was 2023. Uh, this is the, the book. This is the right kind of failure where she talks about um, how do you anticipate failure? How do you kind of prevent the catastrophic failures? And she goes into detail. She has all different charts. Uh, this book more is on um, innovation and failure, but it's a good book. And then I, I have this other little book that I really enjoy. This little book here, it's the Psychological Safety Playbook. And the reason I like this book is it has chapters. And each one chapters, it challenges you what to do. And, and like, here's one, it, it talks about um, um, how to listen, the art of listening, right? Listen to understand, be fully present, clarify your understanding, listen for emotions, commit to curiosity. And then she, this, this book has suggested readings. And this is a quick book to me. It's like, I want to, I'm on the train or something. I want to do something for the day. I can open this up. I want to do these things in my work today. And that's why I like this little book, right? So it's very simple, but to me, it's doable. And then it's got a reference material. And then lastly, it's the book that Pete was referencing um, called Radical Humility, 
right? And in the back of this book, on page 203, it says, Champion a Fearless Culture. And it says, The Business Case for Psychological Safety. And it goes into the whole day about a, building a fearless team. Number one, reframe failure, encourage speaking up. Number three, acknowledge and thank and experientially learn together. And so, Pete, thanks for turning me and others onto this book. So here it is in this book toward the back. And it talks about, you know, how do you how do you do it? And has different examples. So that I I thought was was useful. And then we have some articles. And I want to then pass this on to Joel because these articles are meaningful and Joel wants us to learn certain things from these articles. So Joel, I'm now going to pass it to you. I love that, Dave. I just want to make a comment here that um, it was a, such a great foundation for everything else we're going to talk about. But the other thing I love about it is that we're coming from different perspectives. And uh, speaking of, you know, what we're what what we're going to be talking about next month, Jeanette, right? In terms of different collaborations and such, you know. Uh, just to frame this up, Dave talked about books that are out there, methodologies that out that's out there, the use of psychological safety in common parlance, and of course, the seminal work of Amy Edmondson. Where I'm going to go is that more into the research side and to point out that Amy's work, as great as it is, isn't the only work on psychological safety. And that's why we said at the beginning uh, like leadership, like performance, like engagement, psychological safety is a superordinate construct, and uh, it can be interpreted in many different ways. So the next part of this is first to start to discern what those different ways are, and then we'll do an exercise and look at our own experience of psychological safety. And I'm glad I'm glad Dave started off with his own experience. So. It, he kind of said it, psychological safety for what purpose? And in Amy's work, I think, and I, I know she, she wasn't here, I, I can't say this, but it's for, it's for excellence. Psychological safety for high quality, psychological safety for performance, psychological safety for uh, a high achieving organization. And I think a lot of those books uh, and the comments that Dave made were about being a good leader. But that's not the only thing that psychological safety could be for. So the reason that I have this definition here is that you'll see, and, and Edmondson actually points this out, that psychological safety is really a multi-level construct. It's not just the individual, and it's not just the team, which is where her predominant focus has been on the team and on groups. So here's uh, the most recent uh, annual review, 2023, and she's looking at quantitative studies, uh, and you can see uh, levels of analysis uh, at the top row. So is the measure assessing individual psychological safety, which is I feel safe, I can take risks. Is it measuring group psychological safety, which is Amy's measure, the team, this team, we can talk up, is it making, uh, assessing organizational or is it unspecified? And is the dependent variable in any of those different areas? So when you look at this data, you'll see that 95% of the research is at the individual level, 79% is at the group level, only 12% of the 153 articles that are out there are at the organizational level, uh, and oh, 7% is at the multi-level. So I, I kind of made a mistake there. But the point is, the reason I have these two arrows is that uh, Edmondson actually talks about the three other measures of psychological safety out there that are at, focused on more at the individual and organizational level. And so those are references and you can actually get those measures, I'm pretty sure, uh, from going through the uh, research. So if it's a multi-level construct, the question I'd have for all of you is why do we just keep focusing on the individual level? And that's the bias of academia. And it's also more difficult 
to assess multi-level. So today we're gonna look at multiple levels. What is it for? So safety, everyone recognizes this. What is this here? Can anyone for an additional $5 and a box of chocolates, tell me what this is an image of? Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow's hierarchy. <laughs> right. And so safety, right, is there. It's there, but it's safety for what? And so uh, is it safety to, so you can have teamwork and communication and belong, right? Is it safety for self-actualization so you can perform, produce, solve problems, make good decisions? Or is it psychological safety so that you can make a contribution, that self-transcendence, be of service, you know, have a legacy? So very often, this is not looked at, but to Dave's point, uh, it's got to be psychological safety as a potentiator for something else, as a lever for something else which is what makes it great because it could be used in different situations for different things. This is from that same uh, chapter. And what uh, she did here was look at coward network of selected psychological safety literature selected. Circles represent circle size reflects the number of articles tagged within a given topic. Ties between circles reference co-occurrence among topics and the width reflects the degree of co-occurrences. So what you'll see what people have been using psychological safety for in the, in the literature is performance mostly, leadership second, you can see this. But what's really interesting for us as OD network is learning is not as high. You can see that there. And I'll, I'll kind of highlight these as I'm talking about them so you can see what I'm referring to, right? Of course, performance is the, is, uh, let me get the right color here. Performance is the biggest one. Leadership is right there with it. Then you have culture climate. Then you have learning, okay, over here. Um, what I wanna point out because of my bias, well-being isn't even on here. And yet there is research on psychological safety and well-being. Stress and strain is on here. Burnout is on here, okay? Uh, but this again is the research literature. And I think the coloring is to some extent, I haven't looked into it, but it, 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 there's some coloring also that's going on here. So really cool, isn't this? I love this stuff. But again, what is it psychological safety for? And the reason I put uh, time pressure here is because there was a recent article that came out. Those of you who know, I spoke about time and presence back in the fall. There's a study that shows well, you tell me, greater time pressure in a work team, more or less psychological safety? Anybody want to guess? I'd say less. Yeah, less. Which I think is, you know, that's my hypothesis. It's at the core of the problem. You know, if you have a workaholic, toxic environment, people are not going to be feeling very psychologically safe. So this is the nomological network, they call it, you know, the, the lexicon associated with psychological safety. The, the, in this, again, this is the annual review from last year. She says at the very end of the article, although the cumulative research in psychological safety has provided robust findings related to leadership, blah, 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 uh, several future opportunities are evident. First, we believe that the most glaring gap in the literature pertains to how to create psychological safety. So once again, we see a, a discrepancy. Here are all these books that Dave gave us, right? About how to create psychological safety, but it's not based on research. So everybody, as I always say, is out there selling something now, getting on the psychological safety bandwagon, but is it based on what we know actually works and, and actual specific interventions that leaders can use? So I'll stop right there and ask if there's, if I'm making sense, any questions before we go on. Yeah, I think you're making a lot of sense, Joel. And uh, this is uh, really fun that we are saying 
that we don't quite know how to do it. Because we're, uh, the consensus, I think, is that this is really important. But we also have to confess our ignorance that we don't have a clear direction on how to do it. I was thinking as we were coming into this uh, meeting about teams that I've worked with where I experienced high levels of psychological safety. And I was contrasting that with teams I worked with where there was a lack of psychological safety. And I'm going to have to think about it some more because um, I know I could probably tease out a couple things that the places that the leaders of the teams where I felt psychological safety did. I, I, I think I could point to some, but I don't know that I could really come up with maybe a formula that that I would say is repeatable. I, I could tease out a couple things, but there's still some mystery there in terms of being able to explain how to get there. Yeah, well, that, I'm sorry. I mean, that's the nature of a superordinate construct like leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Like performance, like engagement. It's never, we're never going to, you know, it's always going to be like that until we're very specific about it in its particular context. Yeah. So as an OD practitioner, I think our, our job is to get people to be specific, to think about context, to think about utility, think about purpose. And to think that psychological safety, as it's commonly used, is different than psychological safety as it's needed in our specific work with specific clients. No. That's, that's, I think, the takeaway for that. But what, one of the things that I was thinking about, too, uh, when you mentioned time pressure, um, that it's more difficult to maintain psychological safety in time pressure. But what I experienced when we were in Vietnam, we had some very pressurized situations uh, uh, with the level of danger that we were in. And uh, one of our leaders uh, uh, in, in, in one of the air crews I flew with, consistently in spite of the pressure, was able to maintain psychological safety. And a second crew that I flew with for several weeks because they needed uh, needed somebody with my background was just the opposite. That that he uh, he created psychological danger. <laughs> uh, the more pressure got on, the, the more difficult things became. That's great. And so I know there's a difference, but then. Like you say, I have to, we have to get down to what are the specifics that I saw and heard and experienced, and 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 that requires a lot more thought. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go into some of that now, and then we're gonna do a breakout that'll give us an opportunity to chew on this even even more. I just want to uh, acknowledge one of our staff members just pulled. There are interventions out there uh, that have shown some effect. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but one of them, the intervention was conducting one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, you know, where the leader uh, helped the other, the employee to discuss their needs and or remove barriers. Another was a video presentation on uh, psychological safety uh, to an intervention group. And the group was asked to, to take an action. And another one was a concept mapping tool for students. Uh, and <clears throat> they found that the, the, uh, those who re they reported higher psychological safety. So there are interventions out there, but I could not find a synthesis of what we do know about what works. So I think you can see the dates on this, 2022, 2023, 2018. So people are making efforts. So I want to talk about our experience because we've been doing work in psychological safety. We've done several studies. And before I get into this, we did a study, a team-based wellness program that was a, a gamification uh, tool that involved uh, people interacting on teams to achieve 
outcomes for well-being. And we did find a, a, a trend toward improvement in psychological safety using uh, Edmondson's uh, assessment, but it wasn't significant. Whereas in this other study I'm gonna talk about, which was more uh, real people, not virtual, um, we did find some improvements. And what we did specifically was back in the late 90s when I was at TCU, we developed this measure of privacy regulation. And these are different items than the ones that you see in Edmondson's because we were talking again, you know, our work is in mental health and well being. And the item I'm going to point out here is I feel confident telling my problems to at least one of my coworkers without having to fear the information will leak into the grapevine. Okay, that's, that's different than the, the, my team is a safe place to speak up because what we're interested in was helping to find out how employees who might have mental health concerns, how can we help to create a condition where they would be willing to get help? And we were able to, we included this with a greater, a broader measure of wellness climate. And we were able to not only improve the climate, but through improving the climate, we actually uh, reduced behavioral health problems and increased help seeking. So res respect of privacy, uh, trusting private information, keeping secrets about personal concerns, we call that privacy regulation and it relates to psychological safety, but it's not the same thing. So when we ask what psychological safety for, for us, it's psychological safety for mental health. Right? And I would say that even Dave's earlier comments about what it was like to work in a toxic environment, many employees, uh, they don't feel safe and it's hurting their mental health. So that's one, one distinction that we're making here. Um, so notice that this is different than conflict avoidance. In my work group, it is best to keep your ideas to yourself than to cause conflict with supervisors. So you're starting to, I want what the point of all this is to start to discern what are we actually talking about? And yet these can be related, but they're different and they're different from the psychological safety at the team level. So then there's psychological safety for who? So a lot of the items just don't distinguish between self-expression and climate. I'm not afraid to be myself at work. Well, that's self-expression. Uh, whereas the last item on the left, there's a threatening environment at work, that's climate. And then on the right, you can see this other measure in my work unit, in my work unit, in my work unit, expressing your true feelings is welcome. So we also have to distinguish who are we talking about that multi-level idea when we talk about psychological safety. Some might say, well, it doesn't matter. It really does matter because I may feel safe, but others around me may, may not feel safe. And vice versa, people in my work group uh, may feel safe and I don't feel safe. <laughs> That's where the problems come. So it's important to understand these different levels. This is another measure, um, which is participative safety, where it's all about we. We have a we are together attitude, uh, we share information, people keep each other informed, people feel understood and accepted by each other. So this is also called psychological safety. Then uh, this is a very, I think, well done study in British Medical Journal of Research Methodology where they actually said, let's look at psychological safety at the team leader, peer, and the team as a whole. So Item one, if I had a question that was unsure of something in relation to my role at work, I could ask my team later. Item 10, if I had a question or was unsure of something, I could ask my peers, and it is easy to ask other members of the team. So they actually took the time to start to distinguish these things, and this was important for healthcare. So of course, communication, communication, and communication, and learning. And uh, here's another one where you can see, uh, Disagreement, this work setting are appropriately resolved. Uh, it's easy to ask questions. My suggestions are acted upon, 
but also learning. Remember, learning, learning is subsidiary to leadership and performance in the literature, but it seems to be a key goal for a lot of the people doing work on psychological safety, the error part that Dave mentioned. This is a psychosocial safety climate measure that's getting a lot more traction, and it has more to do with psychological health, but it's called psychosocial safety. So psycho psychological well-being is a priority. Information about workplace psychological well-being is always brought to my attention. So again, you're seeing this conflation between psychological safety for this, for this, or for this. And then I love this one because of the exclusion piece. Do I feel excluded? Uh, you know, I feel that no one will take me in any way. You know, will take my, my ideas seriously. There are deliberate attempts to dismiss my efforts, you know? So that this, is, this is important because I think psychological safety is such a broad construct but it has very, very particular and very deep meaning for some employees who do feel excluded, you see? And it's that exclusion that becomes uh, critical from our perspective in terms of mental health. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna go start the participation part of the program and ask you to take some surveys. And uh, the reason here is that I want you to start to experience or draw on your experience of psychological safety. So the first uh, poll is this one here. I want you to, what's important to you right now? And what I did here, by the way, I took 10 items from all over those measures. So I pulled things from all these different measures. So you're not just looking at one construct at one level. And I'll launch the poll and it's just, What's important to you right now? All that you think are important to you right now in your life and work, in terms of your own interest in psychological, I would like to, and then to check all that apply. Remember, you always need to scroll down or hit the square at the top right of the screen so you can explode all the items and see them at once. And I'll leave this open for a full minute so you can. Uh, respond. And this is check all that apply. It should be set up that way. And after you do this, we'll talk a little bit about what it means. And then we'll go on to the next one. Mine said one of one not answered, but it wasn't showing on my screen. So, but I probably would have checked the box. Okay. Leave it open for another 30 seconds. And we'll see what we get. Okay, here we go. So um, the item that got the most checks was, I would like to know if it is safe for me to have my own opinions, even if they differ from the majority. That was followed by, I would like to be able to fully express myself at work and to be able to speak up without causing conflict. So one person, because I want to make sure we get to the other ones, would anyone like to share why they selected what they did? I can speak. I I selected the one about being able to fully express myself. And I think so often when I was working in an environment, I felt like I in the beginning when I'll just say 
<laughs> there was a point of um, when that changed. But in the beginning, I felt like I had to hide parts of myself and conform to the environment. Um, and I remember having a conversation when it changed. I remember having a conversation with the manager saying, I don't want to do that anymore. And would he allow me to be myself fully? And, and he said, yes, and he did, he really did. And so, but I, I, I think I had grown enough to be able to ask for what I knew I needed so that I could really shine and be my best self at work. So that's why I chose that one. That's great. Like, I wanna like applaud here, like you. <laughs> okay, let's do the next one. It's the same items. And, and you'll, if you bear with me as we go through these, you'll see how there's a pattern that we're talking about here. It's the same items, but now how many of these have been true for you at any time in the past? So it's the same items, but now I have, instead of I would like, I have. So I'll launch that poll. How many of these have been true for you at any time in the past? I have dot, dot, dot. Been, it should say been on a team or been able to. But think about your experience in the past. And we'll see. Right here. Well, wow, we have uh, a, a unanimous, uh, we've all felt a sense of acceptance from and for others on my team. And uh, the one with the lowest was known I can make mistakes without being punished or called out. So who would like to share on that one? That's a, interesting how you can start to see how psychological safety means different things here, see? So who would like to share what, why they, what this pattern suggests or their own experience? So I can weigh in specifically on the note I can make mistakes without being punished or called out. I think that um, particular, I'm very much a recovering perfectionist, but a perfectionist nonetheless at my core. And so the perception to me is that I have never even been comfortable experimenting to see if it is safe to make a mistake without being called out for. And yet you also, I'm assuming, did feel acceptance from others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still so wouldn't, wouldn't dare purposefully touch that fire or try to. So I think that's fascinating because so much of the measures of psychological safety have to do with admitting errors. And yet here we see that you can still have psychological safety in one sense, but not in another. See, when I, when I think of errors though, so if I, if I, you know, have something that was unpredictable or unexpected happen, I can have confidence in that type of mistake. I do not have confidence in acceptance of a mistake that I made, that was within my control, that I made the error on. So it's, it's sort of like being safe to be yourself. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I find that's interesting. Well, let's go on to the next one, which is- Joel, could I throw something in quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I answered the last question in the affirmative, but I didn't answer any of the rest of the questions in the uh -huh. affirmative. And I was thinking about this as we were talking here. And uh, I think oftentimes we can self-censor and be accepted, even though we don't disclose or perhaps because we don't disclose. 
sometimes acceptance is masking myself. I don't know if that makes sense, but that that just occurred to me when I, I was puzzled when I answered that way. There's some research. No, there is. I forget. There is research on. Um, oh, what is it called? There's some research on self-consciousness and psychological safety. Mm. That may be relevant, relevant there. Could I add one more thing about, and sure. I think of things on the team level because that's, I work with teams. So, I, and what I've noticed is that if you have like a strong team identity where everybody is accepting, then you're less likely to want to rock the boat and, uh, um, you know, take risks. You just kind of, it's, I guess, group think is what I think about. And mm -hmm. so, Anyway, um, I just wanted to throw that well, out as well. Get, there's an exercise we're going to do that's exactly that. Okay, okay. So the next one is we've looked at uh, what you would like. We've looked at the past. Now we're going to look at now. What is your current experience? I am on a team. I am able to. I what is your current experience? And my hope and intention in doing this is just to get us to articulate and discern these different aspects. So um, the one that got the most was able to speak up if I see a problem at work. Um, at 78% and uh, feel a sense of acceptance again. The lower ones was work somewhere where people communicate freely rather than avoid problems. <laughs> That's only a small percent of you are currently experiencing that. <laughs> and able to tell my problems to at least one of my the privacy regulations without having to fear the information will leak into the grapevine. So you we know, also have a zero percent, Joel. Oh, we do. Oh, able to speak. Up. <laughs> That's right. What's what's the zero percent? Able to speak up without causing conflict. <laughs> okay, Pete and Jim, this is our time to do an intervention. <laughs> okay, everybody, that's why you were brought here today. <laughs> If only we knew how to create psychological safety. <laughs> what do you, what is this? Okay, let's have some fun here. Obviously we are. What does this mean? Well, if you go by uh, Lancioni and five dysfunctions of a team, he says most teams need more conflict, not less. So I, I don't assume if I speak up, it won't create conflict, but the question would be, is it is it safe to have the discussion? I would say in, in my current context, yes, and, you know, it's, it's okay to do that and kind of stir the pot. Um, I mean, not just for the purpose of stirring the pot, but um, we, we can have a good discussion of the issues and it's safe to do that. A few years ago, I worked with a number of um, senior executive women with vice president titles uh, in an organization, all reporting to the same CEO. And um, none of them felt psychologically safe with that CEO. The irony of it is that each one of them has left the organization and in turn become CEO of their organizations. And as I talk to their subordinates, they all describe these women CEOs as creating a psychologically safe environment. That's great. And I, I, I it, it was kind of an astonishing experience, experience because these women, I mean, it was, it was clear 
from the outset that these were extraordinary human beings. And it was also clear that I was not going to be able to persuade the CEO to change his behavior. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up in a coaching role, helping them to cope with an untenable experience. Mm -hmm. and, and these are powerful women, right? I mean, these are just great in terms of their interpersonal yeah. uh, skills and in terms of their technical skills in the business they're in. So I think Marie, were you going to share something? I want to make sure we didn't lose Marie. She was going to share. Oh, I was just thinking about how, you know, with teams, it's so, it's so important that they all be able to speak up. And it's like you have to train, train the team and talk to the team about Innovation only happens when people disagree. You know, the high innovation scores with companies happen with diverse teams, diverse mindsets. And I think that's a hard one for teams to get used to since we're all taught to get along. And finding ways to have that discussion with teams, you know, not one discussion, but ongoing to explore that and let people figure it out together, even share the data on innovation, um, is probably a useful thing for most teams to do. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, both both your comments speak to different sides, right? The two different, the, the dark and the light in a way. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna do, I have another poll, but I wanna make sure we go to this next exercise because um, well, here's some here's something I like to do when we when we do training. If I were to stop everything we were doing right now and say we're over, what would be the key takeaway from our discussion so far? As I hit the pause button, what's what's a key takeaway? That most people don't really understand what psychological safety is, and they understand even less how they could bring it about. I would also say that I've learned that psychological safety does not have one specific goal. It can be used in many different areas or for many different purposes. Mm -hmm. I've I've learned that I'm not as safe as I thought I was based on your <laughs> oh no <laughs> based on your questions so. <laughs> doggone it I thought I was safe and now you got me wondering no, man, man I gotta go into fight or flight or something I don't know <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no it's not that bad but no it made you really think about go a little deeper and say, am I being my full self? Or, you know, just some of the things, I'd love that survey because yeah, I don't know if you could, I know you're gonna get the materials out, but that third one about now is um, fascinating to me because it did seem low for everyone. Not, you know, it just seemed a little lower than what I thought, not just for me, but for everyone, so. Well, you know, it's interesting being in, into psychometrics that it's really an omnibus survey. You know, I just picked and pulled from different measures, right? Okay. So um, yeah. some people think that's crazy, but I think it's good because, you know, you can have it in one area, but not another. Yeah. Hey, hey, Joel, I just want to, you know, you've got me thinking about the different layers. So my immediate supervisor is kind of her way the highway, but she's not harmful if you disagree. She just discounts what I say. <laughs> but I can go to the branch manager and she'll discount me, but yet she'll appreciate what I'm trying to do. And so I don't feed off the energy of the section chief. I feed off the energy of the branch chief, right? Or I'll go outside to another, you know, network of people like of doing recovery work. I'll call the Department of Interior. Hey, I'm thinking about this idea. What do you think? And then he'll be my coach. And then all of a sudden I'm affirmed to what I'm trying to do. And then I just keep proceeding. And so I'm tapped in not only multiple layers, but multiple people and their personalities or outside the organization to do what I want to do in the organization. Yeah, that is so great that 
uh, people can feel safe in one area, but not another. And that's often where mentors come in. You know, we, we were gonna talk about mentoring one time. So, and coaches, right? So fascinating. So let me, let me go to this exercise because I want you also to uh, have a little bit of uh, fun here, interacting with each other in a breakout. I want to give you a basis for this. So this is from Edmondson's uh, same annual review from 2014. And so, you know, she's been at it a while. And this was uh, a, a summary back then of all the different relationships that she was looking at. And the reason I'm showing it to you is just for us to get focused. Because um, what you're going to see here in the exercise we're going to do, it's really just about this. The, the goal being decision quality and the kind of decision, the quality of the decisions we make. So in the exercise we're gonna be doing, we're gonna ignore all these other things because we're doing this virtually, we're not an ongoing group. Um, and we're gonna look at what can we can learn by going through some uh, exercises together. So having said that, I'm gonna pull from one of our uh, training programs called the Ripple Effect. And this is a, a, a program where it's called the choices we make. And we typically, this takes about when we do it, maybe 45 minutes, but I'm gonna give you a condensed version. And it's about making quality decisions, conscious decisions, again, in the realm of mental health. So there are three types of decisions that uh, we make in this realm. One, do we reach out for help or do we go it alone? The second one is, do we respond to others who might be causing us problems or do we just put up with it? And the third decision is, do we speak up when there's something going on uh, that's hurting the whole group or do we remain silent? So I'm going to um, put you in breakout groups and based on our time, I'll put you in uh, different groups. So we'll have uh, three groups. The first group, and I'll tell you who's in each group when we get to it, would be when you are distressed by a life upset, what are the costs and benefits? What are the costs of getting help versus the cost of going it alone? What are the benefits of getting help versus the benefits of going it alone? That's the first group. The second group, when a coworker is a concern or acting out, they're not meeting their deadlines, they're coming in late, whatever it happens to be, what are the cost of responding to them versus the cost of tolerating? What are the benefits of responding versus the benefits of tolerating? And the third group will be when the team suffers because all don't talk about it, whatever it is <laughs> that nobody's talking about, what are the costs and benefits of speaking up versus remaining silent? So in these breakout groups, I'll, these will be random breakout groups. And uh, the first group, and I'll ask you to take a screenshot of this if you want to take a picture with your phone so you know what you're working on. Cynthia, Katie, Marie, Monica, and Terry. Okay, you'll be in uh, group one. So you'll be talking about the cost and benefits of getting in help or going in alone. So Terry, are you willing to uh, kind of take the lead on getting that data? Sure, my, my question, Joel, is what's our context? Is this in general or are we supposed to think of a specific group or situation? In general and maybe you have a specific situation.